Daniel chapter three. I'm gonna read the entire thing, so get ready. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet high and nine feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue the king had set up. Then they stood before the statue Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A herald loudly proclaimed, people of every nation and language, you are commanded. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, you are to fall face down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and every kind of music, people of every nation and language fell down and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Some Chaldeans took this occasion to come forward and maliciously accuse the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. You as king have issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music must fall down and worship the gold statue. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are some Jews you have appointed to manage the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have ignored you, the king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times more than was customary. And he commanded some of the best soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So these men in their trousers, robes, head coverings, and other clothes were tied up and thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Since the king's command was so urgent and the furnace extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and called, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the most high God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. When the satraps, prefects, governors, and the king's advisors gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair of their head was singed. Their robes were unaffected and there was no smell of fire on them. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb and his house made a garbage dump. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome again, church. Good morning to this gathering. You can all settle in now. Um, I told y'all for Daniel, we're trying to read the entirety of the text each week. And so um, did a little different, didn't give y'all a heads up. Um, if you're new visiting here, we are in the CSB version of it, but you can follow on in whatever you'd like. Uh, for those who don't know me, as I said earlier, my name is Joel McCarty and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here, the pastor for preaching and oversight. Um, I get to serve alongside our pastor for shepherding, Kevin Perry, um, who is out today with some family stuff. Um, so it's just a joy to be a part of what God's doing. It's a joy to be on mission here toward the, the flourishing of Decatur for the good of the world and the glory of God. And so I just want to say, like, I just love being a part of what God's doing. Um, speaking of Decatur, I know some of you were at the Decatur Austin football game this week. You locals will know that that matters a lot, right? I saw some of you traitor. Yes. Yeah, so there we go. You cheering for Decatur? Got a grandson on the team. Look at that. See, now I can't say anything bad about Decatur because of that. So I'm just joking. But I had a, one of our friends, Chrissy, you know, was, is her kids go to Austin City Schools and then she got a job at Decatur and she was repping the Decatur gear. I was kind of disappointed, but it's all right. No, seriously, I love just watching. Um, I didn't get to go to the game. I had uh, all four kids, nine and under by myself Friday night. And so like the worst thing I thought I could do was take them to a football game by myself because my wife was out. Um, and so I was like, I'm just going to watch it on the horrendous live stream they offer. Really blurry, not worth the $11 you had to pay to watch it. But anyways, I did watch the game. Decatur got the win. So um, good for them. Hey, it's just football. So so I don't fight about that. But yeah, awesome. So I thought it was really cool just to see, like I was in a group text with people just hanging out and meeting up at the game. And that's to me, it's just a, a modern version of the public square where people can come together and just hang out and talk and you can be in the community. So it was really cool to just watch. Um, yeah, exciting, no matter which side you sat on. So as you just heard read, we're preaching through the book of Daniel. You know that by now. We're in Daniel chapter three. You heard the story through the text already. So what we're gonna do, I don't really have any points, just kind of like last week. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. We're just gonna kind of walk through the text walk through some exposition, some application of the text, and see how it might draw our affections toward the person of Christ. One thing to note, as we read these stories, there's a lot of heroes in the book of Daniel, right? Our tendency is to make much of earthly heroes, but the true hero of the book is God. Remember, the theme of the book is the sovereignty and faithfulness of God. So that's what we're looking at. He's the true hero of all books of scripture and the entirety of history. For those who care about historic information, if you're wanting to know when the story takes place, it's sometime during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar after the three years of training that the young men had walked through. Um, a lot of scholars believe it's really close, so they still would have been probably around 18, 19 years of age. We don't know for sure. They could be older than that and been full-grown adult men. Uh, we're not specifically told, though, because it's not relevant to the text. What is relevant is what the story tells us. So if you were following along, our story starts off right away by telling us about this gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. We're told that the statue is 90 feet tall, so that's pretty tall, and about nine feet wide. We're not told specifically what the statue is. Growing up, I always kind of assumed it was a statue of himself. I don't know why, but that's not what, we don't know exactly what it was. I think it's significant that that's left out because at the end of the day, what we need to see is that the handmade statue is just a stand-in object for the worship of Nebuchadnezzar and his own kingdom. The text is very repetitive. You might've caught it about the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar was the one who had set this up. It's like, all right, we got it. You can quit repeating it, right? It's, it's over and over in the text. It also reminds us repeatedly about this pomp and circumstance and the ceremony behind it, right? These instruments, we don't even know what they are. The zither, the lyre. Anybody in here play those? No, okay. In the King James growing up, there was an instrument called the sack butt. So that's how it was translated. I'm glad we don't use that translation. You kids in here can laugh at that. It's okay. Yeah, literally, you can go look it up, the sack butt. So don't know what instrument that is. If anybody can play it, let us know. We'll get it up here and uh, we'll have it next week with the band. So, but yeah, so there's this like big pomp and circumstance, right? Because at the end of the day, this isn't actually about worship of a statue. It's about power, control, and worship of the maker 
of the statue, who in this case is Nebuchadnezzar. If you were with us last week in Daniel chapter two, you'll remember that Nebuchadnezzar had this dream that Daniel had to interpret. And in the dream, he was this head of gold on this statue. And I think our text today is trying to show us that Nebuchadnezzar is trying to go about fulfilling this dream he had, fulfilling God's plan for himself in his own way and in his own time. But there's a rich irony here. If you've been following along in Daniel, you, we already know that it is the sovereign creator of the universe who raises up and tears down kings and kingdoms, not man. And so for the original readers of this book, they would have sensed how silly this whole circumstance was for this just golden statue. I mean, people bowing down, like from all nations and tribes and languages, the known world just bowing down to this statue that is nothing. All of this wealth, I mean, made of gold, maybe it was gold plated, we don't know, but 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, this is a huge expense. All these instruments and this big old ceremony for this inanimate object. Isaiah had already prophesied about this in chapter 44 of his writings. Through the prophet Isaiah, God had told Israel, it is God that formed and made humans in his image. And so we don't go and form other things in our image. Only God is reserved for that right. I don't even know if I said that right, but only God can do that. And then Isaiah goes on to mock the making of idols by men. Look at Isaiah 44, nine through 10, it's on the screen. It says, all who make idols are nothing, and what they treasure, the things they're seeking by the making of this idol, benefit no one. Their witnesses do not see or know anything, so they will be put to shame. Who makes a god or cast a metal image that benefits no one? And then like the whole chapter is just like the prophet mocking all these makers of these idols. They say, hey, you take the same wood that you chop down yourself and you use it to make a fire and you got a little bit of leftover wood. And so you, you're like, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go ahead and make this image and we're gonna put it in a temple and we're gonna pray to this image and ask it to save us and rescue us. Like, it seems silly, right? You made that yourself and you're gonna ask it to save you. He, he says that these people that do that can't comprehend or see and they have no sense is the way it says it. They're asking something to save them that they made themselves. See, ever since creation and the fall, humans have been fashioning and forming their own gods, making them into their own image. Because then we, we retain control instead of surrendering to the one God who has fashioned and formed us and wants to make us fully into his image. See, we want to steal glory for ourselves and we do it in the form of making idols. You see it in this passage. There's language of Nebuchadnezzar demanding worship from people of every nation and language. I mean, this is the worship that we read about in Revelation that we'll read about later that we see should be reserved for God alone. And to make sure they know he's serious, to have them at least, you know, go along with his little fantasy, he tells them that if you don't do this, then you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace as punishment. And like the irony begins to thicken even more. Because if you think about what worship really is, true worship can never be forced. True worship, the whole point of worship is that it is willing and uninhibited and it is motivated by nothing but just this natural response to seeing beauty and glory. And like the natural response is just worship. And this whole ceremony is anything but that. It is a farce. It is false worship. And Nebuchadnezzar forces with his influence and power a bunch of people along with his silly game. He gets this list of a bunch of important people, their name multiple times too, showing us that all these people are going along with this. They make the king feel good. They bow down in reverence to this idol to pretend, let's just play this game that it's got value, that this, this statue should be respected and revered. And we're told that the masses join in. Everyone's just kind of going along with the flow to make the king feel good about himself, except for three men, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Because of their convictions about worship, because of their belief in the commandment that they should have no other God or make idols for themselves to worship, they refuse. They have deep conviction. We won't rehash this. You can go back and listen to the sermon from a couple weeks ago when we talked about that, when they made decision to not eat the king's meat. But know that this decision was not made on the fly. Like th this was a part of who they were. 
It came from a deep rooted place of trust in the ways of Yahweh, the one true God. And he was the only one they cared to obey. So there's this group who go tattles on them, right? Maybe you watched the VeggieTales version, version growing up, okay? But King Nebuchadnezzar grows, you might remember the bunny? Yeah, a few of you, all right. I, I literally like skimmed through that last night and prepped for this sermon, believe it or not. It's actually more insightful than I probably thought it was as a kid. So I don't know where that comes from, but. King Nebuchadnezzar grows furious, right? These people come tattle on him and he repeats the command. Like, okay, I'm gonna give you, give you a second chance. Let's do this thing again. Make sure you understand what I'm saying. In verse 15, he says, if you don't do it, you'll be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And then he says, at the end of verse 15, worth repeating again, it says, and who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Like, what a statement. Who is the God who can rescue you from my power? He says, don't be crazy now. Like, just go along with my game and no one gets hurt. Like, play the game, do the dance, no biggie, right? Just, just, just do it. It's just a, a kneel, right? He makes sure they know who's in charge. And this is their response. Look at verses 16 and 18. We're going to read it again. I love this. This is the central point of, of the passage that we're reading today. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, We don't need to give you an answer to this question. The King James said, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. So the question was not a matter of if he could do it, but there was a question of whether he would, whether it was a part of his plan, because they say, but even if he does not rescue us, let me be clear here. We don't care if you're the king. We want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Like, let's just jump to the end. We don't have to play the game anymore. Not happening. They're unfazed. Their loyalties lie not with an earthly king who can destroy their physical body, but rather with the one true God who has the power over both body and soul. They say that if God exists, and this isn't them doubting as much as it is proving a point, it's that, okay, let's, let's play the game with you. If he exists, trust me, <laughs> if we're talking about the God that I believe in, he can save us, even though you say he can't. But even if he chooses not to, you need to know we will not bow. You can give us another chance, but it's not going to matter. You can drop the act. We ain't doing it. See, at the root of who they and we worship, is who we trust more. Do they trust what God has to say or what Nebuchadnezzar has to say? And you see this evidenced by their statement that even if God chooses not to rescue them or deliver them, they are still sticking with him. Ride or die, hell or high water, we're in it till the end. He is the object of their faith, their trust and their worship. They're saying, we've thrown everything on this. It is you where we have placed our hope. And even if all earthly signs point to God letting them down, even if it points to their destruction, they're still riding with him. And I love this because I I think it tends to teach us a little bit about faith, maybe a little differently than what some of us have heard. See, often I think many of us think if we just have enough faith, so the amount of our faith, and if we just have consistent faith, we're just really steady in our faith, then God will come through for us. But here they say, look, our faith is in God, even if it doesn't turn out like we want, even if we don't get the job promotion." even if our finances are trash, even if our health deteriorates, even if we are mocked by the world, even if we are persecuted to the death for the sake of the name of Yahweh, we're all in. And this is the exact opposite of a a health and wealth kind of name it and claim it type theology that says, if you just have enough faith in God, you will be spared from discomfort, disease, or death. In fact, it might even seem to bring those things quicker than otherwise sometimes. And here's the thing, the scriptures don't hide that reality. See, unlike false gods that we create and worship, do you know why we do that? We do it because of what they offer us. 
because of what they can do for us, because of what they bring to the table. But the one true God will not have that. He is not a genie who is just worshiped for what he can give you. He is worshiped not primarily because of what he gives, but rather simply because of who he is. He is worthy of all worship. And the object of our trust behind that worship, who we are worshiping is way more important than the amount or the consistency of it. And thank God for that. God is the only thing or person that can bear the full weight of your worship. And this is the conviction that drove the men in our passage today. It doesn't sit well with Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't like that out of all these people he has control over and power over, that they'll just bow the knee at his whim. These men, he has no power over them. So this heats up Nebuchadnezzar even more than he already has. There's really cool language in the Hebrew where you're trying to figure out like what's hotter, Nebuchadnezzar or the furnace he's about to heat up, right? He's just getting angry and angry, which is ironic because he's the one who thinks he has control and he doesn't even have control over himself. This proves that it is really about power and control and worship for him, not the statue. That's an inanimate object. So he orders the fire to be turned up to seven times the normal heat, which is a hyperbolic statement. Like we might say that team was 10 times better than us, right? We don't mean that to be taken literally, except yesterday our youth team got beat 48 to nothing. So I don't know what that says. That's infinity times better, I guess. But it's this expression, right? Used to make a point. Don't ask me about that. That was really bad. It's this expression, right? And so that's what he's saying with this fire. Now, now most certainly the fire was increased and it was a real fire that really burned and they did heat it up hotter than it normally was. And so we know the story. We've heard it our whole life. If you've grown up in church, they tie them up. They take the best soldiers in the king's army. So there's these really big contrasts in this story, right? These lowly three exiles here in a foreign land and then the powers of the empire against them. And so they, they go to throw them in and even the king's best men in the army are killed because the fire is so hot. Shortly after they're thrown in, Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he sees these three Hebrew men, the exact opposite of the way they were thrown in. They're walking around, they're loose, and there's someone with them. This this fourth person in the fire. The king describes it as a son of the gods, which is the most accurate translation. This was a, a common way to refer to deity in this world. Later in the text, Nebuchadnezzar himself actually calls it an angel, sometimes translated messenger. Who or what exactly it was isn't as relevant as what it signifies. Was it pre-incarnate Jesus Christ? Maybe, that's okay, that's one thought could just be an angel, whatever. The point here is that just as we saw last week that there is a God who interprets dreams and makes his dwelling with mortals, even though they thought that didn't happen, this week we see that there is a God who can rescue from the power of earthly kings. And that's what he does. They're brought out. They're living proof that the king can't deny that God does rescue, that he does deliver. And this rescue is complete. Its deliverance is complete. There's not a hair singed on them. No smell of fire on them, which is a real miracle. Ask anyone who's been around a fire for any length of time or who smokes cigars on my back porch, right? The smell sticks, but not for these men. Their their clothes even aren't affected. And Nebuchadnezzar changes his tune quickly. He now praises their God and says, there's no other God like this, which is a true statement. Next week, we'll see that this most likely was not full repentance. He's still got a long way to go. Most likely, he's just trying to kind of ride the wave of power, right? Just hop on board to whatever God is the most powerful of the day. And as you kind of see it in his response, he, he then tries to move from forced worship to his statue to forced worship to this God as if it's something you can just force on people. Like God sees the heart, right? But he says, hey, if you don't worship this God, you're gonna be torn limb from limb and your house is gonna be made into a garbage dump, right? He's like trying to force this worship. And it's like, you can't bring about true worship with forced earthly methods. It requires a heart level transformation. So, but his statement is true. This is the God who can rescue. And there is no God who can save like this God. This is a fulfillment of the promise from the prophet Isaiah, who promised that when his people walk through the fire, they will not be scorched. 
He said, I am the one true savior alone and there is no God beside me. I am the only one from whom there can be no rescue. When I speak, it is as good as done. He is the only one worthy of worship because he is the only one who has the power to save. And this is shown through the story that we read today. Now, as we read this story, we could spend a lot of time processing it, but but it would be helpful for us to keep in mind that the biblical narrative and reality of history rarely tells of physical rescue such as this. The more common reality in the scriptures and in life is, is one of suffering and pain. It's Stephen being stoned to death for his faith. It's the apostle Paul being beaten. It's saints being martyred and crying out, how long till you enact vengeance? It's saints refusing to bow to kings and emperors and tyrants and being burnt at the stake. It's believers being jailed for meeting in house churches in China. It's church buildings being burned with worshipers trapped inside. I'm talking about modern day, not just ancient history. And that's just active persecution against the church. Then there's also just the passive brokenness of the world that is full of suffering and grief. It's the aging and dying parents. It's the miscarriages. It's the loss of children. It's the cancer that won't go away. It's the depression that eats at us and we just want relief. It's the broken relationships, the divorce, whatever it is for you. I don't know where you're at. And if we take this passage and just turn it to some type of kind of name it, claim it thing where we're saying, hey, you don't have to worry about bad things happen. Just have enough faith, just believe it and things are gonna go okay. That kind of theology is absolutely damning and it will destroy you. And I don't say that lightly. I heard a preacher the other day saying, don't even worry about bad things happening. Just stop being anxious, tell your brain it won't happen because he claimed that it wouldn't. And like, I wanted to scream, but like, but what about when bad stuff does happen? Does what you believe about God hold up in the times of, but if not? Does it hold up when God doesn't come through with with what we think he should? See, the point here in the passage, we fixate on the fact God temporarily, temporarily delivered them. And that's okay, that's a piece of it. But the main focus is not on the fact that God delivered them temporarily. It's that God was in the fire with them. The point here is that God is worthy of our worship. Even in the but if nots of life. And yes, let me be clear. We believe, I believe that God has the power to provide earthly rescue and healing. And there is nothing wrong with asking a good father to come through for your light bill, for your health, for your relationships, please ask him. There's nothing wrong with that. But what about when it doesn't pan out like we want it to? Because even for these three men, the end of our story ended today, but eventually death would still have them someday. This was only a temporary rescue. Eventually they would die and death would get them. However, that came about, whether it be through a fire or natural age, what we call natural They needed something greater than temporary saving from a fire. See, this story is a tangible picture of an eternal reality. And and we're told through it that ultimately God does and can rescue. And, And when we make it simply about the earthly and the physical, we're not asking too much, we're asking too little. We're missing out on so much that God has offered us because we've narrowed our view about who God is and how he chooses to act. See, we all are in need of a rescue, but what we need rescue from is something much greater than an earthly fire or circumstance. See, again, in this story, and as we read through Daniel, our tendency is to see ourselves as the heroes, but the reality is we are much more akin to the crowds mindlessly bowing to earthly idols than we are the three Hebrew men. Most of us, myself included, find ourselves constantly surrendering our allegiances to the things and earthly idols that we think will fulfill us and make us okay. And yes, we're in the 21st century. 
So we're more sophisticated than a 90 foot gold plated tower. And we might think it's foolish and that we would never bow down and worship a false God like that. But let's think about it. The things that we place our hope and value in are just as silly. Political parties, leaders, policies, government will finally save us or the lack of government will finally rescue society. Maybe it's the idol of achievement and recognition. If I just had, if people recognized who I was and this hidden gem inside of me, I'd be okay. Maybe it's comfort, the idol of escape through some form of media consumption, right? Just kind of numbing the pain. Maybe it's our career, right? A worldly definition of success. If I hit this income level, have this type of education, I'll be happy. Maybe this is one I wrestle with a lot is the idol of acceptance, right? Like I want people to like me. So I just give in to the cultural pressures of the day, right? That say, you have to think this way or act this way in order to be accepted by this group of people. Maybe it's football, right? Or other sports. And I'm not joking when I say that. Like you want to see a picture of like 100,000 people coming together, singing songs to something, right? There's nothing wrong going to a football game and enjoying it. But how our team does on Saturday or Sunday, if it affects the way we treat other people, might be a hit. And if you think this list is crazy, like here's a way that I take inventory of these things is how I respond when these things don't go well or they're stripped away from me. What does it look like when your political party loses? What does it look like when your football team loses or you don't get the promotion you think you deserve or you're rejected by others because of what you believe and how you respond in those moments might give you insight into what you might be worshiping. And as we read earlier in our Valley of Vision prayer, all of these things aren't bad things. They're good gifts. But when we take them and make them God in our life, we're in trouble. They will destroy us. They will lead you to destruction. I don't say all of this to condemn you because I'm right there with you. Here's my point. All of us are entrapped by these false idols that call for our worship and tell us to bow down. They claim that they can rescue us and they turn into our masters. And instead of rescuing us, they're leading us down a path much more dangerous than an earthly fire pit. Sin is leading us headlong to eternal separation from the one true God. He is the one we were created to worship. Jesus calls it Gehenna or hell. And it's, it's where our rejection of God leads us. It's described similar to Nebuchadnezzar as this garbage dump, this smoldering pit filled with the inadequacies of our search for fulfillment outside of our creator. And here's the thing, whatever your view is about hell, whatever you think the scriptures have to say, whatever you believe about that, let me say this, the worst descriptions that the scriptures tell us are only metaphors trying to describe something worse. Because ultimately separation from our creator leads to absolute destruction. Empty, vain, void. It's what awaits everyone who tries to fashion and worship our own gods because you can't be saved by something you've created. But thank God, as our story shows us today, it doesn't end with bad news. Even though the idols and kings of our age have ensnared us and claim that no one can rescue us from their power, there is a God who has crawled down into the hells that we've created and invites us into his life to rescue and redeem us. I mean, I mean this, this fourth person in the fire reminds me of the incarnate Christ who, who came as a baby to this broken earth, became flesh, tabernacled, dwelt among us, made his home among us, lived the perfect life for worship of God alone. The tempter tried to get him to bow down and worship other things, money, power, and he refused it perfectly. And willingly, he allowed himself to be thrown into the fire of God's wrath against all sin because it was destroying his good creation. On the cross, Jesus bears all of that for us. He takes on the weight of all of our evil and all of your false worship, and he becomes the sacrificial atoning offering for us to rescue us from the flame. And in the resurrection, he proves that he truly is the only one who can rescue and save. 
He's the one who ultimately wins, right? He has power over all the powers of darkness. In fact, he embarrasses them on the cross. If death itself could not hold him, what is there left to fear? The last enemy is defeated. So we can follow him in boldness, even to physical death, because we know that's simply working a far weightier weightier glory in the end. And this is what you're invited to. This is, this is the God who loves you enough to come rescue you. And, and when we surrender to him, when we repent of our self-righteousness and our quest to fashion our own gods and we turn to him, we trust in the life, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. It's called the gospel. When that happens, we are transformed and we respond in true, pure worship, not forced because our senses are no longer dull and our sight is no longer blind, we no longer join in and parade around in silly worship of false idols. We don't have to play the games that the world has created when they tell us, hey, if you worship this, if you trust this, it will make you okay. Instead, we worship and live for the one who truly is the rightful recipient of every, the right, rightful recipient of worship of every nation, tribe, and tongue. As that happens, It's not about us just trying harder and doing more. It's about beholding Christ, his majesty and glory. And then all these earthly idols just begin to be stripped away because they they pale in comparison to the beauty and majesty of Christ. And so, so instead of living for all this stuff now, we begin to live for his glory and his worship, something greater. So our energy, our time, our resources, they go to see his kingdom advanced, not ours, from our neighborhoods all the way to the nations. And this worship is simply a response to the spirit of God in your life. You cannot manufacture this. We need the spirit of God among us. We can come up here, we can sing songs, we can put together a service, we can have spotlights and cute little cafe lights and decorate a building. But at the end of the day, only the spirit of God in our midst will allow us to respond in conviction like the three Hebrew men. We say, we worship God alone and he can deliver us. He can fix this situation, but if not, I'm still with him, ride or die. You can't fake this. We can say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We don't say this lightly. You don't say that about an earthly idol. That would be stupid. Can I say reckless, foolish? But if it's true, it changes everything. We can't ask for earthly healing or rescue, knowing that if it comes, it's only a foreshadowing of the final healing and rescue. It's like the appetizer to the feast, right? That's all it is. So great, praise God. And when it doesn't come, we can still say, I trust you. Because a day is coming when Jesus will return and set things to right. When all who trust in him will be delivered through the worst circumstances. And looking back to the cross and ahead of the new creation in the here and now, we can run to him. Give him our full trust and worship. Telling everything and everyone else around us, you can't have it. Because it belongs to God alone.